Hey guys, it's Will. Uh, I just wanted to chime in real quick at the uh, at the beginning here. Um, uh, I do apologize uh, that this is a uh, a re-release episode this week. Um, the past week, um, I I got uh, sicker than I have been in recent memory. Um, I did not get COVID, uh, but I I got uh, what I've, uh, I'm pretty sure I got norovirus, uh, which is horrible. Um, it is the most uh, nauseous uh, I have ever been, and uh, I was uh, literally like sore from how how much I was uh, vomiting uh, the past week. Uh, I am on the mend now, so I appreciate uh, if anyone's listening to this that's wor- that's worried. I'm fine. Uh, I'm fine now. I'm on the the mend, but uh, it was uh, a week that left me able to do little much else uh, other than just uh, exist. So uh, in that state, any uh, episode I would have uh, had had for you would not have been the uh, best that I could offer. So uh, this week, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share with you uh, an episode from like the very be- early days of Between Awesome and Disaster. Like I, this is, I believe, episode was episode six. It was with uh, the comedians um, Alexis Guerreros and Christian Polanco, um, who I think at the time, I think the cool, their podcast, The Cooligans, had been going for a little while. But in intervening years, they have seen uh, tremendous success. That's been very cool to watch. They had a show of, on Fubo TV. I believe they have another show now. And they also uh, have made several appearances on a uh, my league premier, uh, my Premier League mornings and the Premier League fan fests on NBC. Uh, they've become like really uh, successful in the the realm of soccer media, and it's been really awesome to see. Um, occasionally, I've mentioned my love of of soccer or football on this on this show, um, but this conversation and something uh, Alexis told me when I was uh, thinking about this, um, a lot of what he said to me in this episode. I did go on to discover and I and especially looked to them when I really started honing in on this podcast of as not just comedians, not just uh, talking about comedy, but like when I decided that I could reach out and talk to actors and reach out to the kind of guests that I've had and like branch out into the realms that I really love, like punk rock and and anime and voice acting, all of that stuff like a lot of the advice that I got on this uh, happened at that point. And uh, so I thought it would be cool to revisit that episode this week. And uh, thank you all again uh, for being here. And uh, I will have more for you uh, in the f- in the future now that I, I am on the men. So I appreciate your patience. And uh, let's check back in and, and let's listen to uh, what me, uh, Alexis Guerreros, and uh, Christian Polanco talked about on episode six of Between Awesome and Disaster, I believe back in like 2016 or 17. Yeah, you guys have clearly done this before, I think. Because, yeah. um, you know, podcaster is just a, a normal thing uh, to have it in the comedy resume nowadays, right? Are we recording already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I ease into it. Oh, okay, my my cool. my only model for uh, for podcasting is like This American Life and WTF. Oh, okay. So they they all seem to like ease into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Those and are, it's still the theme is going to be uh, things that we've struggled with. Yeah, or? yeah. That's like so, something I w- I would want to talk about because I have a lot of problems. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I, I have struggles trying to balance like this career and this in this life, yeah. but. It's really, it's you're a New York City comedian. That's that's weird. We're that's doing odd. just fine. Struggling, struggling. Yeah, yeah. Never. I've never struggled. Never. Yeah, no, everyone I've never ever. heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It just it just doesn't I, happen. I, uh, I saw a documentary about it pop up on Netflix. Didn't watch it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to be disturbed. <laughs> yeah, everything was was going just fine. So Alexis uh, Guerreros and yeah. uh, Christian uh, Polanco. Polanco. That's yeah. it. Um, Probably the I'd easiest d- name to say out of all of them, and you got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so. You guys like I, like Alexis. I feel like I've only started talking to like relatively recently because I was uh, 
listening to the New York City Fan podcast, and I saw that you were on it. And I was like, Oh, oh yeah, yeah, shit! Yeah, yeah. I, that was I, a fun podcast. Yeah, I was because I thought I'd saw, seen a picture of of you on on Facebook. And was like, is he wearing a, a soccer jersey? Yeah, I like that soccer. I yeah. have I have that too, because <laughs> I'm surprised you were able to find uh, a picture of Alexis without a soccer jersey. Yeah, <laughs> or, or, or without a shirt without a pizza stain. My uh, <laughs> as my wife calls it, my summer uniform <laughs> is my my uh, throwback Arsenal jersey. Oh yeah, and, like blue shorts. <laughs> that's I love that. that yeah, <laughs> that's that's the good way to go. To good way to go because I didn't. I'll I'll be honest. I didn't. I played soccer as a kid, and I never really. I got back into it heavily watching the World Cup in in 2014, oh, and then wow, when cool. I saw that there were other people in the comedy community that liked uh, soccer too, I I felt like it was okay to like it. Yeah, because for because for like the longest time, I I thought that you couldn't be you couldn't be in the arts and also like sports either. Were you guys always sports? Were the two of you both sports guys growing up, or were you more like the art and art? type i mean for me i guess no one in my family really liked any sports besides the yankees and i don't mean baseball i mean the yankees the entire <laughs> island of cuba are <laughs> yankee fans so i grew up i'm half cuban half uruguayan my uruguayan mm -hmm. side are massive ben Yedel fans which is uh one of the two big teams in uruguay uh they're massive fans uh i didn't grow up with that side of the family so i didn't know anything about sports but i noticed growing up everyone was like wearing knicks giants jets and mm -hmm. it was my way of sort of assimilating into like you know, American life was to learn about how to communicate with these other kids with sports. And it was hard because I had to teach myself everything about every sport besides the Yankees. I had right. to teach myself everything. So American football took a while. You mm -hmm. know, there's a lot of rules in that. You know, when you think you know everything, somebody gets pushed out of bounds and you're like, oh, it's like 13 new rules there I never heard of. If you haven't picked up on it yet. Alexis definitely grew up without a dad. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, central themes <laughs> of much of my life. Oh, yeah. And uh, apparently I'm good enough friends with Christian for him to mock me for it. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah, we well, it's, can, it's, 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 it's either laughing or crying for yeah. a lot of things, yeah, I'll right? I'll probably do both on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, that, that, that's definitely how, how I am. I saw my mom recently showed me a video from when I was like a year old, and I was like pretending to make soup with a pot, and my dad says, Oh, you got a soup pot and a play vacuum cleaner. Do you think your mom wanted a girl? And nice. that that's sort of like probably where it there's started. A, there's a few moments where I think to myself, I'm better off having growing up without a dad. That was one of them just now oh. <laughs> when I heard that. Uh, well, I'm well, I'm glad I could help you yeah. with that. So basketball, so the Knicks, and then baseball. I mean, I knew a lot about, but like picking mm -hmm. teams was also big. Like I was a little bit of a Vikings fan for a while before one of my friends was like, "You should pick a local team." Because you're never going right. to see the Vikings. Why were you a Vikings fan? Um, I can't remember who their quarterback was, but I just remember thinking like that. They were a fun team to watch. I remember there was one play where everyone thought uh, there was a fumble in the pile, and yeah. it was the first game I ever like clicked on and watched. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person, someone else had run away with the ball, but everyone else thought it was under a pile of humans. And the guy was standing in the end zone, just like dancing. And the referees looked up and they're like, "Oh no!" And they blew a touchdown. And, like, he tricked everyone. So I was like, oh, that seems like a fun team. And, like, yeah. four games in, I'm like, who are these people? Why am I a fan of a team from Minnesota? So I wasn't really right. a fan. But, you know, I focused on them. And my friend was like, pick a local team. You know, Jets or Giants. We have a lot of teams here. So I was like, oh, cool. I'll pick the Giants. You know, they I like their jersey. And I like the fact that it said the Giants across as opposed to just, like, the stuff the Jets had. So I was like, yeah, I was really into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, soccer was something I became a fan of in the, the sort of mid-90s, right around the first World Cup in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, I had heard a lot about soccer from my father's side of the family, mm -hmm. who we had a cousin that lived in uh, in the city and then later on in Long Island who loved soccer. Yeah. So I heard a lot about it through that. Like, I knew who Maradona was and some of these famous players. But, I mean, I I wouldn't say I didn't care. I just said I probably didn't know enough. I couldn't really find it on TV. So I was like, eh, it doesn't really. None of my other friends talked about it, so I really didn't care. Right. Um, but I always knew about it. And then when... When that World Cup came, I just I a switch happened, and I didn't care mm -hmm. if anybody liked it or not. I was just a soccer alcoholic. Yeah, because that was like that event. Um, maybe other than the original Cosmos in the in like the seventies was like right. what kind of got uh, the sport into the American consciousness again? Because like I was I was exposed to it. I never really watched it on TV, but I was playing it when I was a kid because my mother didn't want me playing American football for fear of getting hurt. But I think you can get hurt in soccer a lot. Uh, a lot just worse. As bad, I would say. Just as yeah. just as bad if you watch someone get the, a head 
get headbutted in the eye. Yeah, yeah. So so sports for you. So sports for you were a way of uh, connecting with other other people. Yeah, it was like a part of my American assimilation because I, mm-hmm. you know, are your parents immigrants or? Uh, no. All right. So like uh, for me, it when you go home, you're not in America. Mm-hmm. You're in whatever country they're from. You know. Like the culture is of that kind. It literally, my house growing up was like Little Havana, right? You know, so, so when people were like, "Go back to Cuba," you were like, "All right, I'm just I go, know. I'm going yeah, two blocks actually, away. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm gonna make a sandwich when I get there." <laughs> like, <you know>. Exactly. <laughs> so it was no like so like it was hard for me to like leave that, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden in grammar school be American. And I mean, not American. Like I don't love America. So if any mm-hmm. red staters are listening, don't right. email me. So you're an uh, you're an immigrant. You you, I'm you born, immigrant. I'm from born in this country. You're born in that's the what states. The paperwork says oh, that's what I'm sticking to. <laughs> okay. Uh, but no, like uh, my sister and myself are first generation born here. Okay. Um, but when we went home, especially when we were kids, everyone spoke Spanish, and you know we t- we ate Cuban food and we right. lived by Cuban rules, meaning primarily my mother could hit me <laughs> whenever she wanted, um, things like that. Like it wasn't very American. Like I would turn on and watch TV. And see like growing pains in full house and think, my house is nothing like that. Right. <laughs> like how come the dad hasn't left? How come the mother hasn't hit the kid yet? Like none of that made sense to me. You know what I mean? Right. And so my way of being able to relate to other kids growing up, the por- the Portuguese kids I got along with just fine. Puerto Rican and Dominican kids I got along with fine. But like the, the white kids, I there was no I had There was no white. common ground. Yeah, there wasn't any. Sports became an easy one, especially when you're a kid. Oh, you know, yeah. Did you see that game yesterday? And I'll be like, yeah, I remember I had such a early curfew that I couldn't watch Monday Night Football. But I had mm-hmm. a little portable TV, one of those like little old school tiny ones where like a third of the actual machine is the TV. The oh, rest oh, of it yeah, is like, yeah. So I had this like, I game mm-hmm. with, like the old Game Boy. Yeah, it was like a tiny version of the Game Boy. I used to watch Monday Night Football with pillows around me so my mother couldn't hear it. Mm-hmm. So that I would know what to talk about the next day in school. Wow. Most kids usually did that with porn, but no, you did it with I yeah. did it with sports. <laughs> and then later on I put pillows around a sandwich. <laughs> and here I am. And here I am. Uh is is any of this uh familiar to you too, Christian? Uh, not as much the assimilating part. I you didn't give a damn. Uh you know? no, I I grew up with sports. Uh, obsessively, I played sports like a maniac. But you also had older brothers, right? I did. My older, mm-hmm. I have one older brother. My older brother, he's a professional handball player. Oh, so, really? So he's been playing. Always sounds like a joke mm-hmm. when you say. Yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. It sounds and, like and a sexual you, euphemism. Uh, born and raised in New York. Uh, yeah, I was born in New York. My brother and my both my parents were born in Dominican Republic. Okay. Uh, so they came here. My brother was, uh, I believe, six years old when he came here. So he's basically grew up here. Uh, and so for me, I just sort of uh, mimicked him. He played mm-hmm. handball. I played handball. Uh, obsessed with sport. He's, he's been playing since he was about nine years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've just been going crazy with sports. I played a lot of uh, handball, uh, mm-hmm. baseball, uh, and basketball. Basketball was the one I really stuck to. Yeah, that I, I played basketball for a couple he, of years because when you're my height, it's required. Well, yeah, they yeah. force it's you. Like this, it's like being in the army if you're from Israel. You know? Right, yeah. <laughs> That's uh-huh. right. So, uh, so your brother kind of... I was offensive lineman because of my size. They were like, well, people <laughs> right. are going to have trouble getting around you. So Exactly. They're just looking at you and like, center. Yeah, <laughs> I wish that wasn't true. Yeah. So so you you have one brother? One older brother and, and two parents who are still around. Mm-hmm. Oh, very Alexis. nice. <laughs> good for you. I, yeah. I, I, I joke around <laughs> for no reason. It's like, whatever. Your dad yeah. was probably terrible. I have a terrible dad. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, yeah and he, we, but he never left. We get along with that. My dad was just roaming and terrible. Your dad is more domestic and yeah, terrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, was, dad. was I think there? your parents were at that show we did, right? Um, you had family at that show, no? No, no. My, my, uh, my girlfriend's family was oh, there. Oh, that was your girlfriend's oh, okay. family. Yeah, my... Uh, my my f- family is from Maryland. Oh, okay. Um, that's where they still are. Mom mom and dad aren't together anymore, but that's oh, okay. that's where they are. Uh, but they got they got divorced like later when when I was older. After you left. No, I was I was still I was still uh, I was still in college uh, by the time they finally got divorced. But it was oh, okay. started like uh, when I was still when I was still uh, living in her in my mom's house. Oh. And is that easier to handle when you're older? I feel like that would be harder. You, y- you have. You have like a different. Uh, it's weird because I was 16, so I was like an adult and kind of a child in the same way. And I think most comics probably ha- are not the most emotionally mature people throughout their lives, maybe. Um, so I was. I understood why it was hap- happening, and I knew why it was happening. So it was. It wasn't so much confu. It wasn't 
really confusion. It was just uh, anger at the situation. Yeah. And then and then trying to and then you learn more and then I've yeah. learned more as the years have gone. So it. Who were you more mad at even initially, mom or dad? Uh, You're really deep diving in at here. the yeah. at the time my at the time my dad because you know he flew to. He he f- he uh, left on Christmas Day. That's why. Ooh, <laughs> tough that's a, one. That that, yeah, that that one that one that's makes it that one makes it harder hard to remember. Yeah, and uh, and uh, hard to forget. You mean? Yeah, yeah, hard to forget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially that specific. Yeah, it's day. gonna be hard for me to forget. It easy for me to remember. <laughs> right. You just said. That's a tough one. Uh, yeah, I did the same. Uh, you know, my parents they're still together, but mm-hmm. you know, just th- basically w- Catholic, holding on to some fear that you're not supposed to be divorced. Uh, and uh-huh, so there's. There was tension, and they're con- continuously. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it is never left. And so, at when I was younger, always sided with mom. Mm-hmm. Made no. Si- I was just like my dad, just being an idiot. Uh, never, uh, never sided with him. And yeah. then the older I got, I started to understand like, oh, they, it's like, it's both. The, they're both responsible. Right. There's there's faults that on yeah. both exactly. sides, and exactly. you were maybe told ones person's side of the story and didn't hear the other side yeah and, now you, and then when, when i think of when i'm I think trying back, to reconcile that when i think back on it i realized my dad never did a thing that i that is pretty common he never badmouthed my mother to me right my mother that's actually pretty it's surprising awesome. yeah uh, yeah that's you usually that's good that's, that's the the but, but he those. was but he would be visibly terrible to my mother you right. just never in private said like your mom is actions bad words <laughs> Actions good <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> very yeah. dual v- odd duality yeah, to yeah. my dad real paradox yeah. that one <laughs> yeah i uh i grew up thinking no one had a dad at home i was one of those kids sure and then i remember in second grade i was like uh, my buddy's dad picked them up from school mm-hmm. and i was like yeah, so what's he in town you know <laughs> He's swinging by, <laughs> and uh, my buddy was like, "What's wrong with you?" My my dad picks me up every day, and I was like, "How's it get back to South Florida?" I assumed everyone's dad lived in South Florida, like mine, and I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. And he was like, "My dad lives with me," and I was like, "That's weird, dude. <laughs> you're weird." And then I like made fun of him to other people, and people were like, "You're the no, weird you're one." <laughs> and one of the guy the who one. I remember being like the really sad one. He always looked. I don't know why I remember him this way. He was second grade, but I remember him as having a mustache and like mm-hmm. a big shaggy hair. There's a character who's been on a thousand TV shows that he looks exactly like in my brain. And I can't yeah. remember the guy that I had the actor's name. He played the, uh, the super on friends. Mm-hmm. He was also oh. on the George Carlin show. Yeah. I know, I know exactly who you're talking about. He has long shaggy hair and a big, uh, yeah, big, big mustache. mustache. He looks like, like a trucker, like in every show. He, that's exactly how I picture this kid. And he couldn't have been, he was in second grade. He couldn't look like this. <laughs> he couldn't look like a weathered bar guy, like a regular bar. Right. But I remember him going, I don't have a dad either. And I remember we all used to not like this kid cause he was like sad. He was like crying every 15 seconds. And I'm like, Oh my God, the only one who has anything in common with me is that one. I was like, I better uh-huh. not be that way. And that's when I figured out that I lived a different life than most of the kids. Uh-huh. But I mean, later on, everyone I know's parents got divorced. Yeah. yeah and we, were, and were you guys, did you have to wrestle with that at all? I uh, were you on the wrestling team? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Alexis in one corner, the other corner, his emotions. No, uh, <laughs> I never had to. <laughs> it's weird because I so I've never like talked to a therapist or anything, but I have a mm-hmm. friend who's a therapist. Yeah. And one day I was say it was like a mutual friend. And one day I was saying to them that I think emotions are a waste of time. Right. Like I will be upset about something, but I'm not going to be I would never like if you did something bad towards me, mm-hmm. I would never be like, oh, I'm upset that you did that. And I don't know why you did that. And I would like an explanation. I would never do that. I'd be like, all right, I'm going to move on with my life. Like you're not someone right. I'm gonna fuck with ever again. Yeah, that's what person. what I did. I just kind of if at the first sign of conflict or or some sort of disrespect, I just peace out. Oh, do you? It's just, just See, I'm the other way. Like I'm way. pretty big on disrespect. Like I will voice my opinion to you if I think this was out of character mm-hmm. and I want to maintain your friendship. I'm also pretty big on confrontation. I'm not mm-hmm. afraid of it, but I'm not someone who's like, oh, I'm mad at that person and I'm gonna be mad. I'll hold a grudge, but I'd be like. I don't talk to like if I don't right. like someone I don't talk to them I don't need to this, have friends it, that I don't. It care sounds about. like you have the like the emotional spectrum of R two D two. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I mean, it's a big <laughs> issue in my marriage. He's very uh, defined in his relationship. Yeah, with like people. I'm, like mm-hmm. if I didn't like Christian. 
Yeah. And he did something that I thought was out of his character. I wouldn't care. I'd be like, right. Right. Here's but if you're, fr- but if your friend, yeah. But if it's a friend, I'd be like, hey, dude, you fucked up when you did. Some people wouldn't do that. They would like hold on to it and be like, yeah. I'm gonna be passive and then be like, well, I was very upset. That's why I mm. said something nasty to you. I would never do that. I'd get it out right away. Put it right out on the table. That's why you know my in-laws don't like me too much sometimes because uh-huh. I'm very o- open and forward. But also like I've always and they been probably that way. interpret it as ru- they probably interpret it as rude yeah, because, because the rest I think of them are like, well, we don't say anything. Why is he talking about this? Yeah. But like that's what the dad thing would help me so much with that was I didn't hold on, and I'm sure somewhere subconsciously I have. I'm not saying I'm I'm superhuman or not human. I'm just saying. I mean, you guys could say I'm superhuman. Uh, all I would say is that Wait, I, we're not going to say that. No one's going to say it. I, I was waiting and no one said it. I, I just don't think I held on to those emotions. I right. think I realized pretty early I live in Newark. No one else mm-hmm. does because I was going to like Catholic school outside of Newark because I kept getting in trouble in Newark. Like I live in Newark. Everyone else lives in nicer neighborhoods. Like right. uh, people drive nicer cars than my family. People get bigger gifts at Christmas. I knew right away when I was young. I'm like, okay, I live differently than everyone else here. And I never looked at it as like, well, that sucks. And why? I was just like, look, my family came from another country. This is part of us getting to their level. Right. You know, I was more like upset you, you, that people were drinking milk with dinner. And I'm like, why are you people doing that? You know, that was weird to me. Like those Americans, I would never worried about like the fact that I grew up without a dad. Mm-hmm. I would say it bothers me more now that I know more about the situation. Yeah. Like when you're yeah. a kid, you're just like, no, dad, that's fine. Move on. I have my grandfather who I love dearly. So I was like, whatever, you know? Yeah, I I, I can relate to that because um, I, I want to I want to I would. I completely lost my I completely lost my that's my, my train of thought. No, I, I understand. But what you're saying makes sense because um because I think a lot of people would interpret someone who's really up forward as as being as rude. Um, right. I think it's the opposite. Or, I think it's the highest point level of respect. Yeah, and and I and I actually agree with you. It's easier because that way you deal with it now instead of letting it fester and cause oh, and causing and causing problems and causing problems later. But I think a lot of people just they're either afraid to to do that or they're afraid of how they're going to be perceived well, by the other there's so much person. uh like there, there could be so much consequence to like very much so to, to confronting people about things because you don't know how they're going to respond sometimes yeah. when people meet people that are that forward about like hey let's resolve this dispute like immediately then they see yeah. it as like oh they're like it's like a, some weird threat or uh sometimes those people feel like uh you know you're you're actually being shitty them. Yeah, I've had someone say like, "You're not respecting my uh, my ability or my um, need to feel upset," and I was like, what, "So what do you want me to do? Like you sit here like a <laughs> baby for the next twenty minutes and yeah and pout?" I've lost friends because of it, you know. Mm-hmm. I've lost friends. I've lost a lot of friends because of it because I'm upfront. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not gonna take. I'm not going to waste my time and I don't want to waste your time. Yeah. Like, I've said this to my wife when I first met. If you ever ask me one of those like sitcom questions, do I look fat in this? If you do, I'm going to say it because I'd rather I tell you than someone else. I, that's mm-hmm. my with my friends, with everyone. I'd rather you hear from me than anyone else, you know, and that's obviously we've been together 15 years. Yeah. So we figured it out. But yeah, at first it was like weird. Like she cut her hair one day and she was like, do you like it? And I was like, I'm going to be honest with you. No, I still love you. I'm not going to divorce you or get it i mean at that point break up with you but i, mean, I don't I, like I, that haircut grounds for divorce I don't yeah see why. yeah you know, and no one you know, no one would even be mad at you italian chick from jersey <laughs> yeah I, is that I, is I, that who I, your wife is yeah she's, yeah yeah she's from she's from Secaucus, originally mm-hmm. from hoboken jersey city i mean i'm not i would lie to you if i told you she didn't threaten to throw shit at my face when we first met but i love <laughs> right. about her i need passion i also need someone like her who will call me on my shit right away yeah and that comes from my family my family is the first to you walk in and right away they'll be like yeah you were being a shithead before and I need that. I need that everywhere in my life. I don't like friends that pussyfoot. That's why I like Polanco. He'll yeah. Be the first one to tell you if I was being. He'll soft step. He's kind of a baby when it comes to that. Uh, yeah, but he asked me if, uh-huh. if he looks fat and stuff, and I'm, I get really mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes even without me asking. Yeah. So I think it's, well, it's it's good. My it's hat, good to really Christian. It's really. good to have. It's good to have that rapport because I I I agree with you. I need that too. My girlfriend is very straightforward. And, and That's awesome. Uh, the first couple of times I think I've. I was a little taken aback by it. Yeah. But I'm I'm you starting like a reserved dude. I'm really reserved. Like I'm yeah. diplomatic to to like the nth degree. I'll say what I'll say whatever's I'll I my goal is to just get through the minefield without uh 
cause the minefield of life without causing too much disturbances. Dude, but you would have been great in corporate America. You that's, know, uh, that's the I, attitude to have. In that's interesting because I think it's yeah, really, it's very common, especially with uh, like guys, tall right? dudes, yes, big guys. You, yeah, very, exactly. Very conscious I, of like you don't want to make people uncomfortable because you know you can be you could be scary. Yeah, yeah, I could be scary. Like if if it's I'm like walking behind effect. right, if I'm walking behind you. In a, at two in the morning in the subway, even though you don't and you don't know who I am, I come off as very scary, and I'm always conscious of that. Like, I don't. It we're, we're I've more never car- fought. We're I've more never, cardigans. Yeah, very yeah. safe. I looking. thought you were gonna say we're more scared of you than you are of us. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's what you were gonna say. Oh, uh, like a, like I'm an animal in the yeah, in the yeah, rain like, in the rain in like, the rainforest in one? the rainforest. Uh, you you do, but you also have like a very affable demeanor, so. Even for a big guy, I mean, mm-hmm. which it sucks when you're that tall, like people are intimidated at you immediately. Like, I'm not going to yeah. lie to you. I'd be afraid to get a hug from you because you look like <laughs> you'd squeeze the being at you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's just because you look you're like a great Dane. And say, you know what I mean? You don't yeah. know how big you are. You know what I mean? Ex- exactly. My wife has told me my resting face is like wants to fight. And I was like, I don't see that at all. Like right now I'm smiling because we're having a great conversation. But like, yeah, 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 I very rarely smile when I'm not. You know, um, yeah, like good people. I, or friends. Yeah, exactly. Like that's when I feel like I can I can be comfortable. And it's like there's only like a few people I feel like I can be that open with. Otherwise, my n- natural slate is just trying to be as like neutral as possible so that yeah. I'm not provoking anything. Because if I get in a f- if I get into a fight and the police show up, even if I'm right, I'm the one getting arrested. Yeah, because you're probably the most threatening one. Just yeah, because because I'm the one I, I look like the, the threat. Yeah. Um, so confront the bouncer. They're like, so. Uh, yeah, what was I, the I, dude, here? I they used to work the door. I, I used to work the the door at a co- the most viewed thing I've ever done in in comedy in in New York is almost get into a fight with someone at a Rich Voss show. That's was it. Rich, was it Rich Voss? Yeah, that's <laughs> no, no, not awesome. Ri- <laughs> was it Bonnie? <laughs> some. Was there was some daughter? guy who was just a some guy was just a drunk, obnoxious, uh, Rich like, Voss fan. Rich Voss fan, and yeah. like and he tried to start a fight with a bunch of other audience members and then he tr- I tried to pull him away and he grabbed me and he and he like pushed me and I just held him at arm's length and said don't do it don't do it cuz he's just like fi- he was like 58 years old so what else uh, I would I would be the bad Where guy was this? was this in Maryland No no this was in New York this was at um uh the Laughing Devil which is now the standing room in Long yeah, Island City Yeah 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 was this the Tiny one club. that? Wait a minute. Wasn't there a video of this? There is a video of it. I it's think got I like, saw this video. Yeah, yeah. It's got like four hundred thousand hits. <laughs> yeah. It's the, my my Wasn't stand-up this when the stage channel's was like all the way at the end. All the way at the end. And yeah. And boss is like yelling about doing the show because it's in like a hallway. Yep. And then there's like a scuffle. That's you. Yeah, that's huh? me. That's, <laughs> that's me. In I that gotta watch that. I've that's, seen this video. That's me a, in that video. I never walked into the Laughing Devil until the guys from the stand owned it right so the only image i had in my head was of that video it was of that video yeah. and I, I kept thinking it was a curtained off section of a restaurant because it looks very odd in that video it looks like there's a curtain yeah. along the wall it's a very odd space at that point it was like now it's much more beautiful that they fixed it up but then it was yeah, very the, awkward yeah the space. decor is a lot and and it was hard to it was hard to play to the entire audience because like the room uh, the way a comedy room is set up it has it you can do it in a way where it's a lot going to be a much better show or you can do it in a way where it's going to be a, a difficult show. Yeah. And when you're at the end of a 20 foot long room, you can only play to like the first three tables The yeah. ever, everyone else would just, would just tune out. Cause that was a real hopsteader room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here, so since we're kind of mo- on the, on the subject of, of comedy right now, I, I kind of want to know cause Alexis, I know you. You were married. Still am. Well, you, you, you were married, and and yeah. before you you started doing stand up. Yeah, right? yeah. I I've said before on podcasts that my wife met a skinny kid in college, married a slightly overweight executive, and now she's married to a fat comedian. Uh-huh. Uh, Is that what you were an executive? Before? Yeah, I worked for a corporate. I worked for the corporate division of a very large company. Um, what What was that job? I I managed all of the sales teams in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. All the office, it was office supplies, all the business, the business sales. Um, it was tough. It was terrible. Uh, it was great money. Yeah. But the one thing I take away from all of it is that I didn't feel fulfilled. And the cool thing was 
my wife was right on board, you know, uh-huh. and I had planned to like make a lot of money, which I was making. So I planned to save a lot of it and get out of it. And I thought I was going to buy like some type of venue where people could do comedy. I always wanted to be involved in comedy. I always wanted to be a comedian. Right. Um, but then the economy led me to lose that job. The economy. Yeah. yeah. That damn economy. Mm-hmm. Well, God bless that recession. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how old were you when that I happened? was, what was this, uh, 2008? So I was 27 years old. Oh, okay. And um, I'm 34 now. And uh, I had never done stand-up. I did stand-up actually once when I was like 16. Mm -hmm. I went to an open mic, and the guy was like, hey, you were great. You should come back. And I like snuck into the city. That guy's important in every comic's life. (laughs) And uh, I had snuck into the city to do it. It was called like Bulldog. It had something to do with a bulldog that night. I forget what it was, but it was like a bunch of people that weren't funny, and I just went up there and was like shitty. But I was a kid, so people laughed at that. Yeah. So I knew I wanted to do it. My my wife, I had negotiated an 18 month severance package. So my wife was like, you're getting paid to not work for the first time since you're 12. When I met her, I was working seven days a week. So she was like, why don't you just do what you love for the next 18 months? And I was like, all right, I want to do stand up. She's like, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. And I never looked back. Financially, I've looked back a lot. I thought you were going to uh-huh. say uh, sleep in a bed of sandwiches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now I have a new bucket list item. <laughs> Perfect. How did I not think of that before? Is it semolina bread? Is it Portuguese rolls? There's a lot of questions that need to be answered now. And I'm going to have a tough time maintaining composure on the we rest of the podcast. We can sort out the details later. Perfect. I, I like it. How How about you, Christian? What's the What's the moment that gets you into into comedy? So you're so if I understand you're 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 doing sports you're doing team sports. Uh, no, actually, living in New York. I think never did team sports. I was always oh. too thin, right? I was always very skinny. So I, I was Just good at sports. Uh, no, too skinny. I was you know I'm not I wasn't particularly proud of it. I think very very skinny uh, people and fat people share something. Uh, where people are constantly concerned about yeah, yeah, their yeah, weight. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that happened to me a lot. So, so you mm-hmm. did like a lot of pickup? Yeah, yeah. I played, I played pretty much every day, but I was always afraid of trying out and not making the team because I felt I was okay. like just not good enough, uh, and I felt like I was too right. small. So because so I had the mentality like if you don't try, you'll never fail. Uh, and f- I lived my life very you know sort of cautiously and safely that way. Mm-hmm. Never. Uh, allowing to uh, my ego to be hurt, uh, and comedy was that's f- go ahead. That's 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 really fascinating. Like living, that is very fascinating. like living, like living in a way where your ego is is never hurt. I think that's why that kept me from not dating for several several years. Just the idea of of sure. not wanting to get hurt. That's that's a r- and I think a lot of people live but with that. We're all in comedy where it's nothing but rejection. Yeah, every minute of the day, it's so amazing. This is like our, like, you know, people who didn't go out a lot in high school and then they go and like, like slut it up and do a bunch of drugs when they get into college, like that kind of part. This is our version of that. Like we sure. wanted no rejection in our lives. What? And then you go and do comedy, which is like every all second of that. You're all rejection. Like, We're on a but bender. Yeah. So, so you, so you're living in this way where you're, you're guarding your heart and your, and your feelings. So yeah. And I followed, uh, so my, uh, brother this is what like i have i have this weird sort of youth where i was obsessed with sports but my my brother was a computer science major mm-hmm. and i followed his footsteps and i went to college for computer science but uh, again i'm like good at sports i love i i'm i do it that's what i did a- a- after uh-huh. college uh and so i had all these like uh, uh you know different sides to me that i was like really into okay and uh, but one thing and i when i when i look at my grades in college for my major, for any so any computer class, right. any programming class, always B's and C's. When I look at anything, uh, when I look at my uh, English, history, any creative writing class, yeah. A's, straight A's. I was uh-huh. always more excited, but I never took that as a sign of like that's what I mm-hmm. should be doing. Right. Uh, I was like, well, yeah. computers, that's the thing. You know, who cares if I'm like not doing great in these classes? This is what I'm supposed to do, right. and I'm glad I. I did it because for it, it allowed me to have a sense of stability. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was working, so I was working for uh, Sean John. I was the IT. I was like the senior network admin. Mm-hmm. So you're like the guy who's like, oh, um, the computers are down. Can you fix it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, okay. I, I handle. I can't get to the servers because of all the empty vodka bottles. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> it was the best. Pl- it was the coolest place to work at because yeah, I'm fixing computers and stuff. But then I'm like around rappers and and it's like you know and and it was a. Uh, a majority uh most of the employees were minorities and that i had never worked at a place like that and it was like a so very everybody was late no, i'm joking all right yeah that's a good <laughs> joke 
it was great. I, I, I had a blast, but I was there for five years and mm-hmm. uh, three years in t- into having that job. I started doing comedy. I had a, f- I was uh-huh. just like, where's the first place you go up? Well, the first open mic I did was stand up New York. Uh-huh. Did you say why you did stand up? No. So this was, r- okay. I, no one ever told me, I never had anybody say, Hey, you should do comedy. <laughs> right. Literally. Well, I, you know, I, I, now I have people saying you should stop, but I don't, <laughs> nice. I don't have, I, I never had anybody saying I should. It's just me. But it was, I was absolutely obsessed with comedy, especially in college, but in high school, I was obsessed with George Carlin, uh-huh. constantly watching his specials. Uh, what was your favorite one? Uh, j- complaints and grievances. Easy that's probably, a good, that's a good one. Probably my favorite one. That yeah. was like the first one where I was like, uh, like emotionally of w- aware of what he was talking about. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. So then uh, after that, watched every single special. Loved him. Uh, college obsessed with um, uh, j- joke writers. More polished. Jo- Mitch Hedberg, yeah. Todd Barry, yeah, Dimitri love Martin. Guys. Love all of them. Going crit. And I was just like, man. I, I, I in college, I was obsessively listening to them. And I'm like, I want to do this. I could do this. I, and then I started writing. I just started writing jokes. And I did the thing that they they they. they tell people what were like if you tell people that you're gonna do a thing now you're almost like obligated to do it because you don't want to disappoint right. them so i just started to I, I remember i told like uh this co-worker and i just said hey man you know i'm gonna do comedy one day and i and i it felt good just to say it I, I already felt like a comedian just by saying that and putting that out into the universe yeah and then like uh i i was t- i remember i was 24 uh, it, it, two things happened like emotionally to get me like like it, it, that jarred me into doing comedy. I I went to a- Action Park. Remember Action Park? The most dangerous. The most dangerous water park in, the, in like the wor- in the world. The world. Where, yeah. Where's Action this Park? Is in New it Jersey. used to be in Jackson, New Jersey, and mm-hmm. it there was one thing where they gave you a rolling, um, like a rolling uh, sort of boogie board. It was uh-huh. a plastic boogie board, and there was a huge slide that was like about maybe seven stories tall made out of concrete <laughs> oh and, my god yeah it's super if you dangerous. didn't hold up this bar <laughs> the brakes would jam but you would flip out of it and you would roll down this concrete slot it was the most dangerous way people would literally you would literally see stretchers coming past you as you were there oh wow yeah, so it like was, it was none of it, it was all designed by kids uh-huh. who were like high on nerds and bubblegum <laughs> like no one not one engineer was like i mean maybe we should put a brace here no one did that every piece of it looked like it was it was like a movie like like a like a hotel for dogs kind of movie uh-huh. come to life action park it was you could google it it's there's videos of people being horrifically injured at this <laughs> place. oh it, my gosh but it's what you know it's dangerous super fun. super fun park because of that so i it, bet i bet that's why <laughs> yeah so they have uh they have like a, a you know tarzan swings and all these like fun things uh they have a hundred foot slide but mm-hmm. they have uh, uh like a cliff that you can jump off of into the water and i remember i was always a, kind of afraid of heights and so i was i remember being i was 20 it was the, i was 24 years old and I jumped, and I and the, it was the feeling was so liberating. It literally felt like I yeah. took a risk, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, landed in the cab. Literally, pick up. W- once I once I swam up, got out. I told a friend, I'm like, man, I want to go skydiving. I think that'd be cool. Then about three months later, people people were like talking about it because I mentioned it to them, and everybody's like, nah, that's crazy, that's crazy. And then I was like, let me find out how to go skydiving. And I looked up all the information, found the place, booked it. I told. Friends, I told him, I'm like, yo, you want to go? You want to go? I'm going. And then uh, my brother came with me, uh, uh, like two coworkers came. And the day I went skydiving and like just landed on the ground, I felt like my, my like every fear yeah. I could ever have left. Your outlook changed. I, I, uh-huh. I've done the scariest thing I could possibly do. And I, I, then a couple of days later, I signed up for a comedy class at Caroline's. Uh, and then, <laughs> so you jumped out of the plane. You were ready, and that's it. Yeah, and it literally shocked me into like finally like growing up and being like an adult, not being afraid of like stuff. Oh, that's good because those are lessons I'm. T- I need to. I need to learn now is the not being uh, not being afraid of. Go skydiving, man. I might have. I'm. Um, that might be the way the way to to do it. Because I'm or still go to Action Park. You won't be afraid of dying anymore. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I've pic- seen it. Picturing you skydiving because you you have to go tandem. So basically, whoever you're gonna go with is gonna be super tiny, like gonna right. be a Backpack tiny person. On, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <strapped> to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be adorable. It looks like one of those like. It, doll it's gonna backpacks. be a reverse. <laughs> it's like a reverse baby Bjorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's going to be like, I would help you, but is. I can't see around you. <laughs> right. Or imagine like Shaq is your guy, and if uh-huh. you were once, you look like the smaller of the two. You know that would I mean? be hysterical. That would be great I want, for you. If I have one goal in my career now, it's to be in a situation where I'm strapped to Shaq yeah, right, and, yeah. and it's smaller. I don't know if anyone will if is listening that can make that happen. Let's I want that to happen. That's well, he's from my hometown, so maybe I can make a few phone calls. Oh, thank you. Thank he's you. from Newark. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bill Bellamy's cousin, by the way, speaking of comedy. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Th- wait, what are you talking about? Shaquille O'Neal. Really? Yeah, Bill Bellamy's cousin. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. You would think oh, they would that be similar sense. in size. Uh, no, I think Shaq stands out amongst a lot of people. <laughs> I, including his family his <laughs> father is well well that's a stepfather but his mother is very tiny as well oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, d- I, I don't I, I used to be really into the Bulls in the 90s and then I just kind of dropped off once Rich Jordan tired, retired the second time yeah um, <laughs> what made you get into comedy uh, I got into comedy I was going to school I was going to school for uh, studying acting at the time and I Kind of, I I always was like I had started listening to Mitch Hedberg, mm-hmm. and Dimitri Martin like absurd one-liners because up until then the only the only way I knew stand-up comedy happened was like long-form storytellers like uh, Cosby or oh, okay and and guys like that like I was listening to Bill Cosby's himself uh, I would watch it uh, a lot and. and I was like, I cannot talk for that length of time. I yeah. there's no way I could ever do that. But then I, I saw Dimitri Martin's Comedy Central presents, and he was doing really short jokes, and I was like, oh, that counts. I because I have weird thoughts like that, and I was wanting to, I was wanting to do it because I was trying to, because I was d- getting parts and plays, but not like the, the really satisfying parts lead you want to be like leads or like even meaty like supporting role so i sure. i thought well i want to i want to get i want to do th- i want to give this a shot i cuz i want to see if that maybe this is it yeah. cuz cuz i was taking like the not getting cast as leads as maybe a uh, indication on my ability maybe for okay. a little while but um and then when i did stand up i got uh and by fluke did really terrible bad Mitch Hedberg s jokes but People laughed at it, and then I felt I, you get that first rush yeah. Uh, yeah. that goes through your whole body when you have a good set. And I was just like, "Ooh, I want, I want more of this." And then I kept doing an open mic once a week every Sunday, and that I became that became the thing that no one in the drama department was doing. Like no one was doing stand up was doing stand up, but me and one other guy. Also, like set you apart a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome. See, I never took a class. You didn't take a class either. I was in college and we had a comedy class that had uh, like a section a week or two on stand up and then like sketch and character stuff but I never took like a a stand up class at a at a club. I, I just also never wrote jokes. I didn't know that about you that you like wrote jokes ahead of time. You, I guess it sounds like you did as well. Oh, yeah. I, I thought you were talking when about I st- now. When I like, when I you when know, I started you write jokes yeah. now. I'm surprised you write jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you talk. It's yeah. mostly reading out of the book. Uh, no, I never wrote. The first time I got up well, not when I was a kid. It was just like rambling about right. like my dick, and people laughed because there's a 16 year old talking, talking about his dick. dick. Yeah, um, and I made fun of like the Wu Tang members and what I would do if I could kick the rest. I remember that, and people were laughing like, "Who's Wu Tang?" Because I thought everyone knew who it was. It was a bunch of like drunk older white people in this place. But um, when I started doing stand up, I was like, I remember I had a conversation with someone that I wa- that I was like just got laid off, and I was like, I want to do stand up, and they're like, What are you going to talk about? And I was like. I don't know, you know, I'm always saying funny shit. I'm just gonna go up there and talk and see what happens. And my mm-hmm. buddy was like, that sounds like it's a mistake. <laughs> like, I, he's like, you know, <laughs> I've seen enough stand up to know yeah. that they make it sound like it's effortless, but it takes it's time. It's really like, thought I'll out. Figure it out. I've always been that guy who's like, ah, I'll figure it out. And uh, I remember I was, I went back to Newark uh, to visit my mother and I went to the pizza shop that I had spent a lot of time at as a kid. And the guy knew who I was, like the father and the son knew me. I grew up with a kid. A little bit and I walk in and I said hey you know blah blah and they're like what are you doing now and I remember I said I'm a comedian even though I'd never done it before and I was like yeah I'm a comedian now and he's like I thought you're working in corporate America what happened I was like I'm done with that I'm gonna be a comedian he's like good because you never shut the fuck up <laughs> and I remember thinking like I want people to say more like stuff like that to me like yeah the feeling of saying I was a comedian and people's yeah. reactions to it were so mm-hmm. cool 
that I was like, I'm going to do it no yeah. matter what. And I remember I took a week to like really do it. I signed up for a UCB class. I signed up for that mm-hmm. before I ever did stand up. But I wanted to do stand up before that class started so that I could walk in as a comedian, quote unquote. Sure. Right. And uh, I went up and I told a story about a friend's little brother who like I found out that a bunch of girls had made like a secret fan page for him on Facebook. And I was like. My buddy was like, that sucks. He's like, could you talk to him? Because he doesn't talk to me. He thinks you're cool. And I was like, yeah, I'll talk to him. And I was like, I pulled him aside. I was like, dude, let me smell your finger. Like joking around because mm-hmm. he like bangs all these. And my friend got upset. And he was like, yeah, that's funny. I was like, I'll say that. And I got some laughs because I kind of made it funny. But I was like, yeah, I need to write more. And I've only learned how to write like in the last like three years. <laughs> I've been doing it mm-hmm. for seven. Like, you know, the first four years, I was like, I'm going to sit down and write. And if you look at my notebook, it's just like doodles and things i've already said i since i yeah. was since i was obsessed with uh todd barry mitch and dimitri so you I, probably learned joke structure yeah, maybe like traditional I, joke structure a little bit quicker exactly where whereas like that more like punchy bam punchline punchline well whereas I, like alexis is you're maybe that i'm just gonna i'm gonna be have a conversation and the f- punchlines are yeah in the the st- uh, story yeah like, i was watching absolutely. uh my my girlfriend wanted to see my first set that i did and i hate i just you know i i can't watch it's so hard it's hard to watch because yeah. Yeah. not only am i such a poor comedian right. and, and i didn't do badly i did very well just because i had some a bunch of friends there and stuff yeah but i was so i was a different human being i mean it, it, like you're 24 uh mm-hmm. my my personality uh my maturity like like the, the the level the the kind of jokes I was doing were just so they were so safe they were like I I, I remember I I used to get uncomfortable when jokes were too long I'm like I loved right. the resetting into a new joke because mm-hmm. I felt like if I stayed in a joke too long people would start getting like mad at me that I was like uh-huh. uh, there was too much either silence or uh, so I was very very stuck to that's why I wrote a bunch of jokes before I I even took the class I the, I. The class didn't serve any other purpose than giving me the courage to get on stage. Having someone say, uh, hey, this is when the show is. Right. We're going to practice for right. eight weeks. And so that preparation helped me just yeah. overcome the mm-hmm. fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah. was, I mean, when I did my first set, my knees, I mean, I, I had to lock my legs in place because mm-hmm. I, I, they were shaking so much, I felt like I was gonna pop right off the stage. Really, I don't feel oh, like. You're, are you? Are you a nervous person? Because I'm not at all. I'm a nervous person, like in I my mean, everyday first, life, first but up, like in stand up, not in in stand up. Um, my first couple of sets, I I remember being, I'm I remember just being nervous. I would for not have anything to say, or, or forgetting a line. Forgetting jokes was hard for me. Or I used forgetting to watch jokes. Tape of myself four or five times before we went anywhere. Like if I was doing, like I did a couple bringers at New York Comedy Club. Those were like the first mm-hmm. shows I ever did. Yeah. I and did uh, Clayton, Clayton Fletcher. Young. Yeah, yeah. God, yeah. Oh yeah, I, rem- I, uh, I remember Clayton. He came so to McGooby's in Baltimore. I did a guest hey, spot. McGooby's, I was supposed to do that with Matty Betts, who's from Baltimore, mm-hmm. um, or from that area. Oh, I love Matt. Yeah, he's a great guy. Um, so uh, yeah, I remember uh, the first few. I wasn't nervous, but I remember thinking like, if I don't know what I'm saying, I'm just going to start rambling on some other shit. You know what I mean? Right. I didn't want to do any crowd. Like, I, I remember thinking to myself, like, try to look like a professional comedian. So, mm-hmm. like, I would lean on the mic stand. Or, like, I'd lean on to. the wall. Yeah, I've, you seen, know, like, I've seen comedians do that. I don't know if, yeah, if you look yeah. closely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I did everything I thought, like, a, a professional com- I never wanted someone to think, like, I wasn't good at it. You know what I mean? Even though I started. But I was more worried about, like... Well, I remember the jokes. I knew I would remember what to say when I got in the jokes, but starting yeah. the jokes. And I never had a great memory that way. I remember everything I hear, but I don't remember what I'm supposed to say a lot. So, right. uh, which is why I wasn't a very good actor ever. But I remember watching my own tape over and over and over again, thinking to myself, like, you better not forget this shit, you know? And I didn't mm-hmm. want to write it on my hands because then when your friends see you afterwards, it looks like you didn't know what you were doing. I was very worried about that like level of professionalism, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to forget your jokes every day. Yeah, well, you can't because they're so <laughs> memorable. Yeah, they burn themselves in your brain. So. I, I enjoy your guys' dynamic. <laughs> it, it's it's fun to watch. Um, so uh, here's here's something I'm I'm curious uh, curious about because I think you two both maybe do a bit more clubs than I do right now in New York and maybe and and road work. I'm curious about the 
the moment when uh, you start to build like a little momentum in in the New York scene as opposed to just doing open mics or maybe only get it doing like a bar show yeah. once every couple of months. What was like a, the transition um, into into not just being a pure open micer? And, you know, it's funny. We talked about this before. We both were slightly I wouldn't say the word is envious, but that's the only word I could really use. We both thought each other were at different levels because we saw each other's photos on Facebook. So like before uh-huh. he and I were close friends, we knew who each other were from the scene. And yeah. I used to like not really like him too much because I'm like, why is this guy getting all these fucking shows and opportunities? <laughs> and not just like in a jealous way, but I'm like, I've seen a set. It's not great. No, I'm kidding. And that part is true. <laughs> but like I was like, you know, he, I always looked at him as someone who was like a step or a level above where mm-hmm. I was. And then I found out you thought the same for me. Uh, or like, cause you had heard my name a lot, and you yeah. never seen my set. Like, like that was like you that. You never really know where anyone else is in their career. There are these right. like secret levels for everyone listening. <laughs> there's like these levels that are invisible and aren't really real, but you know they're there. Yeah, yeah. there's a, there are these like, there are the there's these attempts at traditional like a traditional corporate ladder almost. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of achievement. Right, like you know when someone made middle management. There's no party. Right. You know they're not entry level anymore. Exactly. And, have um, you ever had that thing? Where I have this sometimes where I won't see someone for a long time, and then all of a sudden I'm reading their name on blogs and, and stuff. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Good on them. Good on them. Yeah, it's tough. I would say, like, for me, it was a little different because I wanted to just do stand-up, and I still only want to do stand-up. Everything else mm-hmm. I do is to get more stand-up. So yeah. I remember thinking to myself, like, when I started, I did all the hood rooms because that was mm-hmm. the easiest to get booked on and you get paid really well. Yeah. And I wasn't doing stand up that I was very proud of, but it was like easy for me because it was just talking. It's making fun of people in the audience that comes second nature to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember when I first went like and tried to really like build up momentum through the alt scene, it took a while and it was a long time. And I remember thinking to myself multiple times like why am i wasting my time here i can get more work but i wanted to be very proud of the jokes i was doing yeah. mm-hmm. and i wasn't proud of that set so i just stayed in it and then at some point i didn't notice as it was happening but at some point I, i'm like okay people who i respect are starting to talk to me as if i'm not a kid anymore you know what I right. mean? sort of yeah that feeling and people whose names i knew were above me i'm on a lot of shows with them mm-hmm. and i'm drawing the same type of laughter or reaction as they are and then maybe their jokes are better. Maybe they're 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 better at it. But I'm not I'm not struggling. You know what I mean. And I'm mm-hmm. saying things that I'm kind of proud of. Um, and yeah. I feel like my jokes are very well structured. And then at some point, people start to compliment you a little bit, and then you're like, okay, so other people now know. And the next thing I know, I'm building friendships with people who are way way above where yeah. I am. And uh, you know, some of them are taking me on the road and stuff, which is cool because I remember saying mm-hmm. like no one ever wants to take me on the road. Why hasn't anyone ever suggested? And I remember thinking at one point, like, maybe I'm too funny. Maybe that's it. Obviously, that's never the <laughs> that's, case. That's, that's seriously definitely not the case. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, coming from you, that means a lot. <laughs> uh, but, like, you know, you think, like, maybe I'm too funny and they're afraid of bringing me on the road. And it's never that. It's just, like, yeah. comedy, the hardest part about comedy is I've met tons of people that are so talented but don't have the patience for it. Mm-hmm. And it was there was a podcast called um, It Could Be Better that was – Nate Bargatze, Giannis Papas, and typically it was like Chris Laker was, uh-huh. like, was like the third mic on that. Mm-hmm. And I remember they always, and this is Nate Bargatze who now can write his own checks, um, and Giannis yeah. who's doing a bunch of great stuff. At that time, I idolized those two so much because in the New York scene, they were everywhere. Anytime Mindy Tucker put up a photo album, they were in it, and people were like gathered around them, listening yeah. to them. And they kept saying how much they were struggling. And Nate Bargatze once said, people think I'm successful. He's like, I made... $18,000 last year. You know, he's like, and I'm quote unquote successful to a lot of people. He's like, I'm not. He's like, the only way you get successful is you put your head down, do as many open mics as you possibly can, become mm-hmm. friends with people that you think are funny and that you think are good people. And before you know it, you'll look back and think, whoa, we're way further than we thought yeah. we are. Yeah. Than we think we are. And that's, I literally did that. And I remember I saw Mike Lawrence in the train. I asked him, how many mics do you go to? He said, I tried to do 10. So I said, fine. And in my head, I go, I'm going to do 20 a week. Uh-huh. I try to do 10 a week. I'm going to try to do 20 a week. And I tried. I tried really hard. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I failed all the time at it. But right. I was constantly doing more than 10. And people just saw me. People saw me f- fixing my jokes. And people started booking me on shows. And it just it really, like, it's a slippery slope. It's like snowballs easily. Right. One person books you and people hear about that. Other people start booking you. And now it's at the point where every once in a while I'll do a show. And people who are at that show will be like, hey, you should do my show. And that's kind of uh-huh. cool. That's a really cool feeling when you eventually get to that point. But it's not something yeah. you're aware of. There's no like 
you don't get a gold watch when you move up. You know what I mean? You right. just one day you I, look back. I also don't think the that ha- having that mentality of like how do I escape being an open micer? Like I honestly I honestly think there's open micer and there's headliner. I don't think there's any real thing in between. There isn't. There's no gray matter there. Yeah. Right. So yeah. uh you know, because I constantly you know, I, I had the same sort of perception of like, especially Nate and Giannis. I'm like, oh, these guys, I want to be where they are yeah. and all that stuff. But, you know, after doing this for a while, when you go to open mics, the people who have been on TV are at the open mic. Yeah. So it's right. like they're not, you know, they're not above it. They're, mm-hmm. they, they, and if they act like they are, then they're dicks because yeah. they had to. This is what they had to go through uh, to get to where they currently are. So. Uh, mm-hmm. I constantly see myself as a peer and not uh, like, oh, this person is better. They, uh, yeah. yeah, they've been doing it longer. They have they clearly have better jokes than me mm-hmm. and they've earned whatever they have. And I have to work just as hard to get right. there. But when we're in the same club, we're in the same. We grab the same mic. We are peers. Yeah, you have absolutely. to. We have to work just as they have. to. If they are starting with the new joke. It may not work, you know. They right. have to. They have to start where we start. So there's no difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I see the hierarchy a little bit, but I don't let it affect me emotionally that much. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I get jealous. Well, you, you just can are able to to lock in and say it's not personal. But also, it, it hinders your development. Yeah, but mm-hmm. and that's one of the main things that uh, Mike Di Stefano, who I well, idolized. I mean, oh, yeah, he was still great. the funniest comic I've ever seen on stage. Um, he said he was like, the easiest thing is to look at someone else and what they have and be upset about it, that you don't have it. He's like, but while you're doing that, they're working on themselves. You're thinking about them. You're not working on yourself. Mm-hmm. He's like, and, you know, he's he literally said, fuck all else. Look at your goddamn book. He said, fuck all else. Look at your book. And he was like, keep your head down. Look at your notebook. Work on your jokes. And he was a guy who reminded me a lot of me because he didn't write. You know, he went up, he mm-hmm. wrote on stage. And I, yeah, that's what's most comfortable for me. So I do that most often than not. Um, but he was that guy and he was just like, just shut the fuck up and look at who cares what anyone else gets. And he's like, they'll plateau. And Mar- Norm, uh, Mark Norman said something similar to that. It was like, you know, buzz, like he comes and goes. The only thing mm-hmm. that's left at the end of the day is talent. Talent something you create. Heat is something created by somebody else. So focus on what you can create. And I was like, that's exactly what Mike DiStefano said in different words, which is like worrying yeah. about what someone else has is a quick way to never get anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If you focus on you, like not you specifically, just anyone listening or myself, yeah. I tell myself this all the time. No, no, this if is I focus great. on what I'm doing, if only I'm focusing on what I'm doing, I'm going to continuously get better. And I'm not going to worry about anybody else. I'm not going to let any of that distract me, stop me. I'm only going to let their success inspire me because I know it's po- it's a possible thing. Like when Che got a lot of success, so many people became bitter because they thought he did mm-hmm. it quickly. And I remember saying, like, that means people want to hire comedians. Like, he didn't do anything other right. than comedy. He wasn't someone who had a, a great podcast. He wasn't someone who had, you know, a, a great, uh, you know, like YouTube thing. He wasn't someone who was on TV. They put him on TV because of his stand up. That means yeah. if you get better at stand up, they'll put you on TV. Like, do you know what I'm saying? No, yeah. The, that he, economy exists now. Exactly. And he becomes an example that he's not taking jobs from you. He just the idea that he can get that job means that you can get a job. It's right. it's a possibility. It's I, I had this. Uh, I I still have this dream of I love the Daily Show. Yeah. Uh, and for a long time, I just have a dream. I, I would love to host the Daily Show one day. That would be mm-hmm. a dream come true. And oddly, when like Trevor Noah got the job, yeah, there's like this. It was like this. Not it wasn't jealousy. Like a how dare you? But it was it was like wow, like that's such a cr- like the thing I was dream I was dreaming about, and it's like there's this guy who is a minority, kind of looks like me. Yeah. Really, uh, but it's like wow, it it wasn't crazy that I had that dream. Yeah. Because no, it, not it, at all. It's always the oh they're just gonna hire another white guy and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. But it's like holy shit, like this is like kind of my dream and it look it's like you know it's not me but it's it's pretty close it's kind of like exactly you, yeah. it's <laughs> and and that gives because once it happens once that means oh it can it can happen again exactly. yeah and it, it becomes the norm it sets a standard a uh, possible yeah. standard yeah yeah like that potential is it within hand within reach i should say yeah. yeah yeah that's really good that's really good what you were saying about just put your head down and focus on just because you have the i think sometimes and and i'm 
I've been guilty about this too is is worrying about things that you don't really have control over. It's the like you don't have. Do. Yeah, you don't ha- like. It, but if you just focus on, I've I'm trying to focus on what I can control and what I can create. That's why I started producing a show and yeah. started uh, and and am starting to do do this. Just finding and and this like I don't I don't know about you guys. I don't talk like at length like this too too much. So it's uh. It's it's All I do really is talk, good. So this is great. But it, but even doing this is gonna help you just grow on your own. Like I when I started my podcast, I was doing comedy. Yeah, I l- I'm I'm sorry. Can, can Please do. compliment me if you're about to compliment me. No, no, because <laughs> I I love the idea of your podcast. So wow. I was like, oh, I need to. Cause I need execution. to. I gotta. <laughs> no, 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 no. I I. I it's okay. Just, <laughs> I I am so. I am so unintentionally a jerk. Uh, no, you weren't. I wasn't a jerk oh, at all. That's, that's, okay. Yeah, it's, that's uh, Alexis. Uh, be more I, a jerk. Cool. That's I, cool. I, I saw the opening. <laughs> I jumped in. Um, so uh, you, you were saying when you started your podcast. I, I was in a place uh, sort of in comedy and emotionally where I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what direction I'm going in. Uh, nothing. You know, I wasn't necessarily lost, but I was looking to you know the 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 repetition of doing stand up and going to mics yeah i i felt like i could be doing more and one thing i learned about myself you know i never uh, again i never talked at length into a microphone i never really talked about myself i remember the hardest thing to do on my podcast was do the intros by myself Mm -hmm. so you know i would do them after uh the guest left or, yeah, you know, so and I would uh, just talk about what the episode is gonna be, and I remember I would sweat, I would be mm-hmm. uncomfortable. I'm like, oh my god, like I'm talking about myself. Who am I talking to? This just seems really odd. But after like 10, 15 episodes of doing it, I just so all of a sudden became this like, I could you know I could be this radio guy that could intro yeah. any segment, yeah. and and that you was you get really good at it after a while, and it's a good skill to have and not mm-hmm. and not solely just for uh for comedic purposes but just right. as a person who's not self-conscious it helped me get out of being self-conscious or talking about myself uh-huh. uh, even though yeah there's a there's a clear line of when it's arrogant and, right. and and when you're showing humility but it's when when you know how to manipulate that in any given situation whether you're on stage or just talking to people at a party it's a good good skill to have yeah and it you know fantastic my uh, bill burr said that you know, his podcast, he rants for an hour, so it's a little different than, than yours and mine and, and Christian's was. But he said it, it gave him the feeling like he was ranting on stage for an hour. Mm-hmm. And he built parts of jokes and jokes from from doing that. talking into a mic once an hour. And he said, you know, it's very rare that you get an hour on stage every week. Yeah. Uh, so for him, I mean, for Bill Burr, who's already a legend, mm-hmm. if that's helping him, this is only uh, my podcast is only going to help me. Christian's yeah. podcast is only going to help him. This podcast is only going to help you because it's this is forcing you to, to, to think on your feet. And maybe these are jokes that you do on stage in the future. And yeah, ex- and exactly. And there's so much cynicism, especially amongst us. We're all very cynical. And yeah. like mm-hmm. we may. Oh, how many podcasts do you have? How many podcasts? Like everybody's yeah, just talking nothing about was worse than trying to succeed. Exactly. In this so it's like I know. And who? like this, I get really upset with the snarky facebook says is i'm just like well then let's not just try to create anything exactly. yeah because because your your po- um alexis your podcast is called uh show me your bits yeah. and then your podcast christian was called uh off stage off, off stage so alexis is detail you're detailing like you're breaking down yeah jokes it's, it's sort of a loose version of that it you know it becomes more of a conversation but yeah mm-hmm. we we play a bit and we break it down you know was it real did it really happen uh-huh. and then we kind of talk about like a lot of times we're talking about people's like ability to write and how they came up with the joke as much as we are talking about the actual joke oh fantastic and and uh off season was uh is relationship advice yes uh off stage off, off stage. stage i'm i'm sorry which yeah. is it's in the off season off season moment. is a great right now it's in the <laughs> off season <laughs> no but mm. uh, so i would do the yeah the podcast was about relationships and i would talk to comedians about how they dealt with relationships because at the time i was single for six years and i was like wondering why i was like not in any i wasn't able to like commit or i wasn't emotionally attached to any girls i was dating and uh, I was at a point where I'm like, I just need to talk. I need someone to talk to 
That's how I feel with this. Yeah. I need someone. I just need someone to talk to. <laughs> talk to. Well, here we desperately. Are. What, like, what did cries you? For, podcasts are really just cries for they're, help. They're cries <laughs> for help. Giannis is this my is favorite episode of yours, too. Oh, thanks, man. Because this is something I, I really want to talk about, and then I, I guess, and then maybe we'll start thinking about wrapping up uh, yeah. in, a, in a little bit. Um, what is what is something that you did you did you find an answer to your questions about relationships from comedians and because i with with this life and and trying to have a relationship i want to ask ask you this too alexis because you're you're married is maintaining uh a balance between your between comedy so that you are feel like you're putting in the work and and getting better and then but also not neglecting neglecting your relationship because I have a I have a problem with that and uh, it's difficult. I don't want to lo- I don't want to lose either. Difficult. Yeah, and there's no, it's not difficult. You don't so, think so? So what no. what did you what did you <laughs> find? Well, well uh, tell us, Swami, what you think. <laughs> what what did you find? What well, did what you I, find? I, so the things I learned, I would say, from comics, and I recorded about 150 episodes, right? So I did have a lot of it was a, a good a lot case, of content, a lot of content, a lot of research. Cause yeah. it, my this is my life's work yeah. to some degree, right? Uh-huh. And I would say. Uh, from comedians specifically, uh, uh, the thing I learned, or the, or the the biggest sort of mistake is just like not being honest, right? And that's uh-huh. a, that you, that's common. Uh, that's every relationship. That's every relationship. But speaking, comedians are, are able to uh, um, uh, talk about that subject in in more detail and in a much more connected way than just regular people can, right? Right. So there is. It is so brutally important to be uh, honest with yourself in mm-hmm. any relationship because I, w- a, a good example was I remember when I was in college and I had a, you know, they, they would send the, your report card in the mail. And yeah. I got, I got uh, my report card once and my, I was with my first girlfriend and my mom handed me the report card. I opened it. I, I, I did poorly, like in my major, you know, I was getting like B's and C's. I just yeah. I wasn't happy with it. I opened it, looked at it. I was like, oh, this is disgusting. She um, uh, she was like, oh, let me see it. And I said, no, I don't want to show you. Right. And she was like, why don't you want to show me? I'm like, I just I don't want to show you. And it became this huge, huge fight. She started crying. Right. Because I was like, I was keeping something from her. I was hiding Uh something from her. Right. Yeah. And it's like, but in reality, what the fuck was I so ashamed of? Yeah, I didn't do well. Look, at whatever. This is who I am. And I wanted to hide who I was from her, which was a poor student. Right. Yeah. Uh, who didn't take school very seriously or whatever. So I didn't want her to think those things. And constantly when I would talk to comics, it's just like they just con- this repeatedly hiding something about themselves that would be detrimental to their relationship. And not not the, the it wasn't the secret that was the bad thing. It was that they the didn't actions want to hide it. The actions to hide right. it were are the worst. Are the things that would keep someone mm-hmm. that loves you at arm's length. And right. The biggest thing I learned is ec- th- these are my flaws or these are the things I want. And if, if you don't like it, then don't be with me. And I'm, okay. I, I've become a very uh, uh, not not a uh, cold person, but very uh, uh, clear and very sincere about which call back to what I was saying. Right. You're very upfront with how you are. Oh, yeah, right. very, very yeah. much. So like when I even when I was dating my current girl, my ex-girlfriend, I'm like, your comedy is first. You will don't ever fight it. You're never going to be first. So let's let's like not have that battle because you're never going to win. So if a woman can accept that, if any, you know, if you're in a, if your, your friends partner, can accept that anyone can, if accept your that. partner yeah. can accept that, like, oh, wow, this the person I'm with is very passionate about what they want to do in their lives. They will respect it, even though some days it's going to be tough because it's like they want that attention. They, they, they feel envious to like, oh, he loves something more than me. But at the end of the day, they will respect you more. And if you budge from that passion of yours, they will take advantage because they saw that they could get in once. Opening. Yeah. So uh-huh. it, the more you commit to like, this is what I'm passionate about. This is what makes me me. And this is why you liked me when you met me. And right. you can't try to change that now. And mm-hmm. that's a great way to look at it. So the more you stick to that, even if uh, look, I every day I risk my relationship. I'm like, if my girlfriend had some issue where like it's comedy or me, I'm like, you're don't even ask because you're not going to win. Yeah. Uh, right. And I honestly, uh, ever since I've kind of 
uh, uh, lived with that philosophy, all the relationships I've been in have been so much better. It's that smoother. L- like yeah. I could, a- everything, uh, uh, every kind gesture is is feels genuine. There's never this like competition. Or earning brownie points. You're exactly. It's like that, oh, yeah. you know, I, I I don't do the thing like. Uh, you know, I could be doing comedy and I'm here with you. I'm not that guy. It's like right. when I'm there, you know that I want to be there. That you want. And, then, and you can still know that if you're there, that you're not going to suddenly be fall off the face of the comedy map. Yeah. I, yeah. It, it's all, Which you know. Which scares the hell out of me still. It's, I mean, it's, it's finding a balance. Uh, you know, I took I, three weeks off and a couple of people asked me if I moved to L.A. <laughs> I had a big <laughs> editing project. I was like, I'm never doing that again. I've. I've had a few people ask if I quit. I'm like, no, I'm just in this place. Yeah. I'm just in this place a lot. I, uh, my advice being married, having became a, become a comedian after already being married. So I was at that point already eight years into my relationship. I met mm-hmm. my wife uh, 15 years ago, was married a year or two before I got into stand-up. Uh, it was easier because it was a choice from both of us for me to start it. Uh, so it was a decision we both made together. But... Um, one of the things that I think I've worked on the most is saying, uh, especially when I decided I was going to try to do 20 mics a week, I said to my, I sat at my wife down and I said, look, in order for me to become successful at this, I need to focus more on this. Um, unfortunately, this is something that happens at night. That's when you're home. So I am going to do this. This doesn't mean I don't want to be with you. This means that I'm, I want to be with you more in the future. So I'm going to work really hard now so that I have that so she could come on the road with me and do those things with me so we could spend mm-hmm. more time together. I said, but, you know, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, this is going to change the dynamic of our relationship. That doesn't change how we feel about each other. And I'm going to make a concerted effort to make the time we spend together more meaningful. And mm-hmm. I think that's the best advice I can give to anyone who's in a relationship uh, where comedy obviously comes first. And my wife has said, I've told her, uh, you know, I'm married to comedy and cheating on it with my wife. That's how <laughs> it has to be. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. At this level, in order for me to succeed, it has to be that level of commitment or else I'll, I'll always do stand up and never succeed at it. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. It'll always be there. It'll 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 be worse for our relationship. But if I don't do this now um, and what I've told everyone is make the time you do have special. So. I don't need to go to a mic or two before a set like I had to when I first started. Right. Uh, you know, to be comfortable on stage, I had to do like one or two sets, get the jokes out, and then do a show. Right. Because the show was so important. Now I don't necessarily have to do that, so I'll take more time. I'll plan some like things to go do in Brooklyn or in Queens or something outside of we live in the Upper West. So like mm-hmm. we won't do things right around our apartment. Like I'll find a new restaurant, I'll find like a store she likes. I'll do those things so she knows I'm making an effort to still have like some type of regular relationship and we'll spend right. all day with each other. And then, you know, I'm out at night doing stand up, but also it helps that she's a photographer. So she has mm-hmm. things she can do. Right. So the rule is if I have a microphone in my hand, she has a camera in her hand. I mean, it's obviously a loose rule, but mm-hmm. it's helped her become a better or certainly a much more effective or a much more productive uh, photographer having that sort of that idea in mind. So she's like, I'm not mm-hmm. going to just sit here and watch TV while you're gone. I'm going to do something else, too. And that's helped. So, like, some friends have been like, oh, it's good. i got to get my girl a hobby. I'm like, a hobby is not going to do it. If she has a passion, you should encourage her to follow that passion as much as they're encouraging you to follow yours. Yeah. And wow. that was huge with me, with her having been a photographer, because she understood what I was going through because she had been doing that for so long. So that helps. Yeah, one of the things. Wow, that, that is fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love that. Well, like Just to piggyback on that, one of the things – that was always very very important to me was someone dating someone whose uh, whose relationship wasn't the most important thing in their life i mm-hmm. like yes. when i whenever i would date girls when i was the the main focus of their life and and the person that they wanted to make happy or please i'm like that is not the girl for me i can't uh, you because it's th- you're never going to get that uh reciprocated and you're going to resent me for it so have mm-hmm. a thing you love doing I please be passionate about it because that is the only way there's going to be any real balance. And one of us is not going to hate each other for yeah. like just loving something. That's n- right. It won't work if they don't have something else that they're passionate about. If you're the thing they're passionate about, mm-hmm. then come sit at open mics and shows with me every night. And yeah. you're not going to want to do that. So why don't you go do something? Look in the back of your mind and think about what have you? What did you want to do when you were a kid? Luckily, my wife was a great photographer the entire time we were married. I never understood it mm-hmm. until I started doing stand up, and I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. And I encouraged her to do that. 
Wow, that's really fun. that's yeah. really good. That that makes a, a lot of sen- a lot of sense, and you might say I have saved my relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to hear that's, that. That's that's excellent. Well, this was oh, a lot of fun, dude. I I uh, thank you. I'm I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I appreciate you guys talking to me. Before before we get out real quick, I wanna I'll I'll do another plug for it too. But what's your um? You guys have a uh, web series. Uh, yes. Yeah. That like you a, do like a podcast, the web series. We've got some videos up. It's awesome. Uh, we're we're the Cooligans. Mm. Ah, it feels good, right? Same Cooligans. The Cooligans. Yeah, so we've all heard of soccer hooligans and, mm-hmm. yep. and how they like to fight and stuff. And we're just too smooth for that. Uh, <laughs> so we're Cooligans. Yeah, I like uh, it. We're just afraid of getting punched. Mostly. Yeah, I don't want to get punched. I'm too pretty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I ruin the money maker. Uh, but it, yes, exactly. it's a, a, a soccer uh, YouTube channel and podcast and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we we try to be comedians uh, who do soccer related content. Yeah, so if you don't understand a lot about soccer, you'll still laugh. Yeah, it's if you like soccer but you haven't laughed a lot, watch it and you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know we, we we talk a lot about NYCFC because we're both all three of us are all soccer three of us. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so we talk a lot about that, but we, you know we're going to get into a lot more world soccer stuff, and we talk about world soccer on our podcast. So if you guys are EPL fans, La Liga fans, you know, listen in. I think you're going to laugh. Uh, I'm sort of the crazy emotional one. Yeah, I'm the. Uh, I'm more reserved. The lot, the you know, the logical. Yeah, reserved logical. Guy. Is, I would say logical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I you're think, you're the I one that's the like coming thinking, to an end. Oh yeah. Yeah. What What's your team in La Liga? Um, I, I Atleti is the closest thing I have to a team because I just mm-hmm. love Simeone, their yeah. uh, their their coach or manager. Um, but if I had to choose between Barca and Real, I'm more of a Real fan. Uh huh. Only because. Like, they're so glitzy that it pisses everyone off. And right. I just like that about them, you know? They're like the dude who's like, yeah, I have a Lamborghini, and yeah, I'm going to use it to go to the supermarket. Sorry. Yeah. Like, that's that guy. I love that. And I love Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, he, yeah he's he's great. He's really, really good at playing soccer. Yeah, he's very good. He's great at a lot of that's things. That's an yeah. understatement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I had one thing I would say about him is that he's very good at playing soccer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's usually how I compliment people. It's just like they're very good at what they've decided <laughs> yeah. to do. Yeah. It's a nice way to compliment them because you can't be wrong. <laughs> you cannot. Yeah. Well, that's that's awesome, guys. And if you ever need a big dork to walk through the background wearing a, a custom jersey, I have a couple. <laughs> nice. Cool. So Love awesome. So one. so excellent. Thank you. So, guy Alexis Christian, uh, thank you for talking to me. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you, dude. Thanks, for having, thanks us, man. for having us. Excellent. Thank you. I was really green, and they were nice enough to chat with me, and uh, that was in my recorded in my old apartment in in woodside um so uh i was really green and uh it's interesting to hear how much i feel i've progressed so uh thank you guys again for being here this week uh new episode uh new episodes on the horizon so thank you again uh for your understanding and uh i'll see you next time between awesome and disaster take care everybody